All right, welcome everybody to VFPG. Um, this week we have a, pre a presentation by An Ying titled <coughs> Tectonic Processes at 2.0 GA Evidence for Evidence from 600 Kilometers of Plate Convergence Accommodated by the Limpopo Orogenic Belt. So on this oh, I'm going to sharing your screen. And Andre is going to introduce us or introduce you for it. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, An Ian. Sorry, uh, we're kind of working from uh, Geological Survey of Japan and uh, internet went down. Uh, so, uh, but uh, um, An Ian is best known for his work uh, in Asia on collision of uh, um, India and uh, Asia. Uh, and uh, sort of on new tectonics and uh, relatively recent tectonic. But as I was preparing introduction, I realized that he started early on working on Precambrian geology and so started with master degree in Beijing University working on Precambrian geology of uh, North China, and uh, which he didn't uh, finish as he transferred to uh, University of Southern California, where he did PhD, and the PhD was again in pre, uh, area with Precambrian geology on Belt Supergroup, uh, working on Lewis um, Frost. And when he uh, started as a faculty member at UCLA, where he made for ranks to full professor now, and uh, uh, recently he started work on uh, Precambrian in South Africa on uh, Limpopo Belt with Alfred Kroner and uh, other people. And uh, uh, when we were thinking about uh, bringing people talking about plate tectonics, I was looking uh, for somebody who would be, uh, so who could talk about early start of plate tectonics and we met in field school and so uh, just talking about different things I realized what Anne is working on this topic and would be good to talk in our seminars so it's a pleasure uh, to have Anne here and I pass it to you. Great thank you so much um, let me just get a first slide shared and then, oh, wait a minute. This is actually it's the wrong slide. <laughs> wait a minute, let me, let me find a good one, uh, right one. Okay, so that is the right one. Let me see if I can find it. Oh yeah, right here. Okay, so um, this is almost a, you know, when I'm thinking about giving this a talk, I'm really thinking about celebrating the life of uh, Alfred Kroner. He's a, such a mentor to me. Um, whenever I think about him, you know, I really feel emotional uh, because I was close to him uh, in a very long way. Uh, Audrey just mentioned that I was uh, starting uh, as a, a geology, uh, uh, starting my geology working on Precambrian. It was partially inspired by Alfred Kroner, who visited Peking University when I was a third year undergraduate student. And uh, he really inspired me, uh, my interest in early uh, Earth history. Then my advisor, Xiangling Chen, is uh, uh, one of the leaders in Precambrian geology studies in, in China. And uh, I decided to work with him um, for a master's degree in the uh, Northern China uh, granul uh, granulite belt. And I didn't finish that work uh, because my advisor was uh, traveling, visiting uh, quite a few famous uh, geologists, uh, including Ken Condi, who's uh, also, I just saw uh, your name is uh, also on the uh, on the viewer uh, list. Um, 
but in any case, he uh, uh, remotely supervised me to read many early Earth papers, including quite a bit of a lunar geology papers. Um, this was 1982 or 83. And then there was an opportunity for me to come to Southern California uh, working under Greg Davis. So that basically started my career in Cordillera. Then I got distracted to Asia, then stayed in Asia for a long time. And then I reunited with Alfred Croner. We uh, started teaching a short course, uh, touring through different universities in China. And that uh, got me to know him uh, very well. Uh, and then uh, he, uh, he uh, constantly ran field trips. I decided to join him just for my outside hobby. Then I really got hooked with the Limpopo and the Barberton belt. I also did quite a bit of work in the Barberton with Alfred, but I'm not going to mention about that. So just to start with uh, Cromer, <laughs> Alfred, every time I'm uh, thinking about uh, Alfred, uh, this is a so Alfred, always wear shorts, uh, ready to take a shirt off, uh, plunge into any water pools uh, uh, in nature or in the hot spot anywhere. So I just really enjoy that aspect of not only doing field work, but just always enjoy uh, you know, your surroundings. And also I worked with the legendary uh, uh, Gwinta Brendo, so this gentleman, he's been director for the Mpopo Geological Survey or Scientific Council for many years. Uh, I don't know anyone who knows about Limpopo rock better than him in South Africa part. Uh, he basically can blindfold it or drive in any spot. He just say, I want to see this kind of rock and find it. Anyway, so this was uh, one of the uh, uh, few shots that uh, we, we were together. Um, so he was very instrumental for guiding me to see all the key outcrops for me to make sense of this uh, orogenic belt. So uh, another sort of a set note uh, on this is that I, I had this idea and uh, 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 Alfred and I, we talk about this idea. I actually, I gave a talk 2014 in GSA meeting to present this. And then I never made this as a priority until I heard the news that Alfred got really sick. So Walter Mooney and I flew over to see Alfred in late March. We saw him and we had a great three days just chatting. And then finally say, on, let's put this paper together. You know, it's it's idea that I'm not completely agree, but uh, publish it. So I went back, rushed to write it up, and Alfred um, uh, made a very very detailed editing. Uh, so you can see that this paper received May 14th, and Alfred passed May 22nd. So basically, only just a few days after he edited this manuscript passed away. So it it, it really set me greatly. So. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, think about all the great times we had together. Um, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful. I think also the community is very grateful for, 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 uh, his presence, uh, in the pre-camping studies. But I, I went to South Africa several times and the field trips, like different people, they, they all have a different perspective, so, but they all have a, their, uh, 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 you know, particular well study areas that really, made me to think uh, uh, broadly. Um, so I've been to uh, Botswana, uh, South Africa, and also Zimbabwe, part of the Limpopo Belt. So that gave me the holistic view of this, uh, of this system. So <clears throat> I know this is sort of the, you know, <laughs> um, when uh, Alice told me that uh, th th there are more people interested in plate tectonics uh, than uh, usually other subjects, I thought maybe I should make this a little bit broader. Uh, to start, particularly based on my own perspectives, because I've done quite a bit of studies um, on the planetary aspect. So I want to cover sort of the four things. One is to really define modern plate tectonics versus primitive, uh, primitive plate tectonics. I think the debates are very, very vague in the community. And this, uh, this, this actually occurs both in planetary communities that I've been involved, like working on Mars, Mercury, Venus, icy satellites, and what is pre tectonic, what is not. But also in pre Cambrian community, I found that there were quite a bit of a misconfusions about what, what they talk about, you know, what they mean about a plate tectonic. So I'm going to make a little bit of definition based on the fathers of plate tectonic, how they define plate tectonic. Then we'll talk the, the planetary perspectives, alternative models, and then finally I will use the geology of southern 
Africa Limpopo Belt as an example to test some of the uh, uh, basic concept. So let's just start with the plate tectonic. So Harry has basically figured this out. Uh, his central idea is that the thermal boundary layer was created by C4 spreading. And that's what we call the uh, uh, lithosphere. And uh, 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 Tuzo Wilson, uh, another hero of not just me, I think it's a generation of young scientists of my age, uh, basically uh, show that the uh, plates can move not just hundreds of meters <laughs> or hundreds of kilometers, but uh, we're talking about thousands of kilometers uh, based on the hotspot reference he, he interpreted, but now it's a uh, common knowledge. And then um, the uh, plate motions. So the plates can move and the plates may or may not be rigid. So we have to remember that when we infer those large motions, the, the plates don't have to be rigid. But the, uh, uh, the intro, introduction that of uh, Aeola uh, uh, a pulse um, to describe the plate kinematics and how they can match uh, the observation like C4 spreading, really put this in a quantitative uh, kinematic model uh, that has a predictive power. That is not enough. I think the most important part of modern plate tectonics really demonstrated by Le Pichon is that the plates on the globe all moving. So the plate tectonics or modern plate te tectonics is expression of a, a kinematic linked network of plates. So it's not a locally you have subductions, the rest of the place just a stationary, but the, every part of the uh, earth, the lithosphere sort of moving and that are moving rigid blocks is a, a kinematic linked network. So the globalness is also very important. So finally, we, we go full circle and the seismologists finally connect all the dots to show that the plate tectonic is the process of recycling the thermal boundary layer or the lithosphere. So let's define plate tectonic based on what our forefathers actually did. So I would say if plate tectonic has the five elements. One is the thermal boundary layer genesis through seafloor spreading, large horizontal motions. When I say large, that means the motion has to be greater than the thickness of thermal boundary layer. Therefore, when you plunge the thermal boundary layer down, you have a chance to have a recycling. So if it's less than that, you can have a plate tectonic. If the movement, say 10 kilometers, and the thermal boundary layer is 100 kilometers, no matter how you move them around, you can never recycle the uh, uh, thermal boundary layers. And then the third is uh, the global network. Fourth, of course, this rigid aspect can be described by uh, the uh, 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 um, the, uh, uh, the rotation pulse and angular velocities. And then the thermal boundary layer is being uh, recycled. So then you see this very well cited papers. Everybody to talk about when plate tectonic first started. But no one's just saying what they're talking about. <laughs> so this is a very frustrating when you read those papers. So are we talking about a birth of a thermal boundary layer, large horizontal motion, global network, region plate kinematics, or thermal boundary uh, uh, recycling? If you read John Karanaga's paper, the plate tectonic in his mind envision is a recycling of a thermal boundary layer. So this is a diagram from his paper. So it's not really the modern plate tectonic as we understand with other uh, uh, associated uh, uh, elements. So let me, so in my past 10 years of writing, I imply the, uh, my definition of a primitive uh, tectonic versus a modern uh, plate tectonic. Basically, if you have any of the five elements, if that operates, I refer to as a primitive plate tectonic. The reason I say it's a primitive uh, at a plate tectonic is because any of this one element can expand and lead to the full blown development uh, of a modern plate tectonic. So then what is a modern plate tectonics? You just add all five elements together. So that's a definition. So let's look at the planetary perspectives, what a, a, plate, uh, a, a primitive plate tectonics uh, may look like. So first, uh, let's look at the uh, Mercury, which is uh, the smallest uh, uh, terrestrial or rocky planets in the inner solar system. Uh, 
because it has a very large iron core and iron core uh, does not have a whole lot of radiogenic materials, the iron core shrinks uh, through time due to cooling and that affects the lithosphere deformation. So the surface of uh, mercury uh, uh, is uh, uh, covered by a very long, uh, uh, narrow thrust belt. For example, this is one of the long north-south trending thrust belts uh, mapped by Paul Byrne and uh, his associates. Really, uh, is a part of the uh, uh, messenger project led by Sean Solomon. And uh, the idea of a uh, mercury shrinking and the contraction deformation was really first proposed by Sean, uh, Sean Solomon. So here you have this uh, narrow uh, uh, belt, so you can uh, divide this area into two rigid plates with one relatively discrete uh, boundary. So in the rigid block motion sense, this is a primitive tectonic. You can imagine if this belt is keep con contracting and keep going, and when the motion, the magnitude is large enough, you can generate uh, subduction. And also the kinematics can be described by the uh, uh, pole of a plate rotation because on the sphere, um, you can see the thrust belt uh, dies out in some directions. So this is, can be reconstructed by that. And so on Earth, when we look at the faults, we look at the false scarves, we look at the offsets of uh, marker beds. Uh, so the planetary studies, uh, their best the markers. Uh, so their marker beds is just a bunch of craters. So when the crater gets offset, you can see some scarves. Uh, you can see this part of the crater gets offset, this part also. So that's sort of the evidence of a thrusting. So then look, if you look at the Venus, Venus have this kind of a local, almost a plate tectonic like features. So Venus in the equatorial area have many of those uh, circular features called a corona or cronae, um, plural. And uh, those features have those kind of ring shaped uh, uh, thrust belt. So this go around, but in the middle, you can this almost like a mid ocean ridge, like transform from like mid ocean ridge transform. Like. So you expand in the middle part, and people propose maybe a plume coming up. Then the uh, 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 the uh, uh, lithosphere, uh, lithosphere on the two sides push aside and then causing contraction, some transpressional uh, tectonics. So this was the famous uh, retrograde subduction model proposed by Sandwell, uh, uh, Dave Sandwell and Jerry Schubert uh, uh, quite a few years ago. So you can basically have a, the hot materials coming up. You can imagine it's almost like in the cold place, you have a, a layer of ice, the lake, you poke a hole, the water coming out, if the water is very, very heavy over the thin ice, you can push the ice down and that would generate this kind of a subduction uh, situation. So then the Mars um, may have uh, this kind of a slab rollback process to generate a tarthus. This is the model I propose. Some people agree, some people don't agree, uh, but it's a testable hypothesis. It explains the temporal evolution of the uh, volcanic belts, which is a uh, yawning towards that direction. You can see this uh, uh, linear belts, but also there are many features uh, covered in the paper I published uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> okay, so that's sort of planetary stuff. So let's talk a little bit about sort of alternative uh, models. Sorry, I'm trying to talk a little faster because I, I do want to leave it for a bit more time uh, for uh, discussion. That's for one reason. Second is that I'm hosting our job candidate uh, right after this talk. So I also want to finish this a little, little fast. So alternative models. Okay, so uh, Turcotte proposed this uh, heat pipe uh, concept. This is a kind of interesting because the model uh, later on expanded with a numerical simulation by uh, uh, Bill Moore and Alex Webb. Alex Webb was my former PhD student. Bill Moore was a former student of Jerry Schubert. So they basically uh, advocate a way of recycling thermal boundary layer without a subduction. So they refer to by uh, Moore and Webb as a volcanic overplating model. So basically you generate lithosphere, you cool, that's completely from the, uh, uh, you know, the earliest evolution of any sort of rocky body. 
you have a magma ocean, you freeze the shell, and eventually uh, cooling down, you change it from a sort of a high percentage of melts to low percent of melts, but you still have the convection like what we see today, the theory of mantle lithosphere. So the volcanic eruption would piling up the surface and then you push the lithosphere down. At the same time, you can have the convective removal, basically you have a convection underneath, dragging down, you can also have a melting process. So you can maintain this a steady state. So this is the model that Moore and Webb are proposed. Not only that, if you have a very fast overplating process, you will generate low geothermal situations that looks like subduction zone. So this is sort of an interesting alternative model. Um, and there are uh, quite a bit of a planetary analogs like uh, the Jupiter's, uh, the, uh, Ju Jupiter's only uh, rocky satellite Io, uh, which uh, operates like this. And if you look at the, our own moon, look at Mars, uh, Mercury, at least they are, they were all covered by uh, basaltic flows. Uh, most of them by the uh, 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 flood basalt type of uh, eruptions. So then you have the uh, the underplating models. <laughs> so this is the famous uh, Bedard's model. Um, and then you underplate, and then uh, the mafic uh, underplated materials that went through uh, uh, phase change, uh, then acclimatized uh, lower cross dropped. So you have this kind of recycling process. But that's recycling only sort of in the lower part of the crust. You, you don't re recycle the entire crust on the top. <clears throat> but you also have the hybrid models. I'm not going to go into it. So those are sort of the uh, primitive, uh, uh, so, 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 so the uh, alternative models strongly emphasize the vertical uh, tectonics. And we can just uh, make a very rudimentary zero throw order uh, 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 predictions for the vertical tectonics. So we say, okay, then we probably should see steep shear zones, steeply plunging, uh, stretching lineation, uh, uh, steeply plunging uh, fold hinges. And then for the uh, prediction of uh, some type of primitive, primitive plate tectonics, they have some kind of horizontal motions, uh, will predict the horizontal um, uh, striations and if the thrust belts will see sub horizontal uh, fold hinges. So those are sort of the first order kind of or zero order kind of predictions we can uh, differentiate. And this has been done since the, the first day of plate tectonics. Okay, so now with uh, 25 minutes into uh, the hour, so we can talk a little bit about Limpopo, but also I want to make it very simple. Uh, there is many sort of nitty gritty uh, details of people debating, but I'm just going to introduce a sort of very general outline. Okay, so the uh, Limpopo belt is uh, located in the younger uh, uh, Kraton, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, this uh, mar marked by this uh, uh, white uh, area, Kalahara, uh, <laughs> Kalahara. Uh, 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 Kraton, which has a Zimbabwe Kraton, the Kaval Kraton, and a very small uh, tectonic block uh, on the side, and it's divided by the uh, uh, Magandi Arc or Magandi Belt right there. So this, uh, uh, so so this is a this uh, Cretano group has this high grade rock uh, sandwiched between Zimbabwe and uh, Kaval. Um, this uh, belt is about uh, 600 kilometer long in the northeast, the southwest direction, and about 200 kilometer wide uh, right here. Um, so the belt is interesting. This has been uh, very well known. The belt has been uh, divided into uh, three zones by four uh, uh, tectonic boundary. Um, and almost in a symmetric fashion. Uh, so the very southern part, you have this uh, southern margin zone bounded by this uh, thrust belt as a people uh, inferred. And you have a strike slip shear zone um, right here. And this is uh, the central debate. This is a uh, Palala shear zone, whether it's a right slip, left slip, we're going to come back to root, 
uh, revisit this one. And this is Central Belt. And this is the uh, uh, another shear zone uh, in Zimbabwe known as a triangle shear zone. I love this one, triangle shear zone. And there are other names in uh, uh, Botswana uh, over here. So then you have the northern margin zone and you have the northern, northern margin zone uh, uh, bounding structure people infer as a thrust fault. At least uh, this feature uh, I visited in the field that uh, it is not just a, a thrust fault, but it has a quite, quite a significant uh, uh, left slip uh, shear zone. And uh, this part looks more like the thrust uh, part. Okay, so we have a, a strike slip. Uh, uh, early days, uh, people think that this is a left slip fault, but then people think some part may have a right slip fault. And I see the kinematics uh, in both ways. And this one is a uh, uh, right slip fault and seems consistent from the place that I've seen in Boston. Okay, so this was presented in a geology short paper uh, on this one. Another aspect is, is a metamorphic grade uh, distribution. So the central part is uh, granulite facies as you move north and south it decreases from uh, amphibolite facies to brinchus facies. And uh, this is the same thing. And the decrease in metamorphic uh, grade is uh, quite a rapid. Uh, we're talking about maybe five to 10 kilometers. You basically go out of the granulite uh, zones into uh, typical uh, lower amphibolite facies or uh, upper green facies uh, metamorphic uh, conditions. Okay, so that is sort of the setup. So. Then I encountered this paper, there are probably more data now, but in general, it's a, a you know, it, it followed this pattern. So this is a, a summary by a Kramer, a young Kramer and Maury. Basically they show that there were two phases of a thermal event. The first event is characterized by batholytic style plutons, basically scattered both in the central zone in the northern margin, southern margin, and you can trace those uh, plutons in uh, uh, Zimbabwe and also in the Congo. The second group is a 2.0. So those are mostly cooling ages um, and their uh, particular central zone have a many, many local granites. So this is something that it really got me to think. So I had a few trips with the Kroner to many places several times Every time we see the the uh, uh, local granite, or ask him say so. So uh, Alfred, what's the age? He said, no matter how you date it, it's a two point oh. <laughs> Whether it's deformed, undeformed, monetized, not monetized. You know, we're talking about maybe plus minus 10, 15 million years. I said this just reminds me of my experience in the Himalayas. No matter what we do with the local granite in the Himalayas, you date it. I would say fifteen plus minus five to seven million years always in that range. You don't have anything older, anything younger, but it just this uh, uh, and the pervasive. Everywhere you see the high grade core of the Himalaya, you see this. So that's basically started this whole process. So this is the famous uh, Sand River outcrop, uh, which uh, the widest part is about uh, two kilometers. It's a really spectacular if you want to see metamorphic rocks and ductile deformation. And when you look at a detailed structure geology, as I'm going to show you, it is a uh, Amazing. Okay, so uh, this you can see that it has a various uh, uh, felsic and mafic components, and you can see the discordance, quite a bit of a discordance between the uh, pre predominant trend of the foliation versus the local foliation. So that's one. So here's an example of a leucocratic, uh, leucocratic materials. So pervasive, it just reminds me the Himalayas. Um, and uh, if you look carefully that uh, those uh, leucogranates are folded like that, it's quite a similar to what I see in the Himalayas, but it will come back. Those are folds are very interesting. So for example, you see this layer, this is a folds right there. And this layer is a very, very straight coming across. And then when you look on this side, you will see more folds, which is always have a something on this side, but there is not like a symmetric, you have a folds like this. Fold. So we're gonna see, okay. So let's talk about early models. So the early model, basically people think, oh, well, you have high grade rocks, must be orogenic event, we have a collision. And then people say, well, it's hard to explain the central part. Then they say, well, let's add a terrain. So you have a, the uh, uh, Zimbabwe in the north, a terrain in the middle, another uh, uh, large continental mass, uh, Cabal 
in the cell. So in any case, this involves, if this is a plate tectonic process, you should have a arc. And as, as I mentioned that, there is a, the, the granulite phase is a metamorphism. Maybe locally there's a relic of a, a older granulite phase uh, metamorphism 2.6. But the majority of the deformation events in this entire origin belt is 2.0, and the, the local granites as well. So then the question is, what happened to the 2.0 collisional event? If this is a collision, where is the art? Where is the suture? Where is the fallen basin? Where is all that uh, 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 powerful prediction plate tectonic? You should see the whole association of all kinds of things, but none of that exists. So this actually uh, led to, so, so those are the issues uh, led to the other alternative models. One is interesting. This is by McCord uh, and he's a colleague to argue that if you have a, a right slip fault here, and if this is a left slip, traditionally interpreted as a left slip, and what I see in the field really dominated by left slip, shear zone, this is a polala shear zone. So it really looks like in present day to, uh, or orientation, this looks like a big ductal flow, a tongue flowing into this direction. So this is what is known as a glacier, glacier flow thrust extrusion model. So it's like a thrust belt, but it's somehow it's a big tongue coming out. Okay. And those are granulite facing rocks. You say, well, how could you get this lower cross rock floating on the surface? So mechanically, it's very hard to, uh, visualize that process anyway. So this is difficult and those were the problems is, such as how you flow granulite faces rocks on the surface even though some people still uh, 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 entertain this uh, a possibility uh, as a recent as a one or two years ago. But uh, another one is that if we make the two shear zone the same sense of shear so that's really led by young Kramer's group to emphasize that not only the triangle shear zones right slip, this is also right slip shear zone, even though there are quite a bit of evidence. We were actually in the field. There were about 15, 20 structural geologists from China and also a few from other countries. Everyone we saw in the field in that particular spot, they're all left slip, at least for the spot we were taken by Yang uh, Kramer. It was uh, di different from the right slip transpression of shear zones shown here. Um, in any case, um, so this is a, so the problem with the, the intracontinental deformation model is that there, there are other places that people did a document, such as by McCord, I'm going to show you. In one place, you have a two zones. One zone is a left slip shear, and another zone is a right slip shear. And that seems very, very convincing. So I can believe that the shear zone may have uh, both the right slip and left slip, so as is shown over here, and I will give you an explanation why this is the case. So before I give you that, uh, um, uh, 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 you show some uh, uh, complication of the shear zone on the southern part, uh, let me just uh, outline the model that we propose. So this is in the geology paper, you can read, I'm not going into the details, but I will give you more of a sort of the evidence that we support as well. So what do we suggest is that there is a, a, a craton uh, we refer to as a missing craton. And this is a basic present day uh, uh, coordinate. So there was an ocean collision between combined Zimbabwe and Kaval craton against this missing craton. So as you collide it together, this is like the Himalayas. Himalaya was a generally entirely uh, in the subducting plate on the India side. People will say, oh, the suture zone is a suture zone in the Himalaya for you know, the, the beginning geologists. And no, no, the suture zone is actually on the north side of Himalaya. If you think about this is the Himalaya, this is what it is. This will be Tibet. This will be the suture zone. And uh, most of the suture zone uh, along the southern part of Tibet is covered by back thrust. So this is the back thrust was discovered by uh, uh, Augusto Ganser, uh, when he did uh, his uh, pioneer research uh, in the uh, southern Tibet. In any case, so this would be sort of the configuration we envisioned. And then this uh, orogenic system gets uh, folded, eroded, and then 
this part of the continent get a rift, so this will be old suture rift away covered by the rift uh, sediments. This will be over here. So this is a, our model. What's the evidence? Okay. Oh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about implications. So if this model is correct, you would have an inverted metamorphism underneath the big thrust sheet, as in the Himalayas. And uh, uh, the Himalayan style collision would uh, uh, predict you know, with some kind of delay from the initial collision, you have a pervasive uh, 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 anatexis due to the thickened crust and the re relax the geothermal uh, gradient. Um, and a uh, very large amount of a convergence because this uh, is basically a half thrust clipper. So if you look at the clipper size, this is a 600 kilometer, so that's the minimum of this place. And this is great because when you walk across over here, this is the folded inverted metamorphism. This is also another folded in, in inverted metamorphism belt. So you get uh, the two sides. That, um, okay, uh, so then you get the two sides um, and then let's talk about evidence. So the evidence for the, uh, uh, this model basically come from the three aspects. One is evidence for folded Limpopo belt. This was noted for quite a while, but very few people put this into context for paleospastic reconstruction. So I really want to emphasize that many of the Precambrian structure geologists interpret the structures in present day orientations. If you have a vertical fault, have a strike slip a, a, a component, they call it a strike slip fault. I think that the better way to say it is a strike slip shear zone in modern coordinates because it could be rotated that Clement, 90 degrees become a vertical. And that's the situation that it envisioned for the Limpopo belt. And uh, the third is variable uh, sense of a shear. So we're going to talk about this, uh, those features. Okay, so the, the uh, uh, person who did a extensive work is Bumby, who uh, uh, mapped a very uh, small outcrop, uh, 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 little area uh, called the Blomberg, which is a mountain, and it named that uh, a very uh, unique uh, uh, formation, Blomberg formation, which is shown over here. So this is map made by Bumby, I redrafted, and just to show some of the uh, key features. So you have the Limpopo, so this is the Mount Blomberg uh, Limpopo uh, nice right here, deposited by some volcanic rocks and uh, uh, folded, uh, uh, doctorally deformed sedimentary rocks. So we were able to look at this contact with uh, uh, Guinta uh, Brendel uh, in the field. So we're going to show some of the pictures. So here's a picture of this uh, uh, spectacular contact. You have this uh, doctorally deformed sedimentary sequence with the volcanics, and you can see uh, unconformably on top of the Limpopo granulite faces, nices, and then that contact is folded, tilted, and then overlain by the lower water berg formation, which is right there. So that's uh, uh, Andrew Zuza, my former student, and I was associate professor at the Reno, Nava uh, uh, University of Nevada, Reno. And this is my uh, another former PhD student, now professor at U, uh, uh, UNC in Will Willington, and that's uh, uh, Gwinta Brando. Okay, so this is a close-up view. It, you, this is a, like the geologic mecca to see what angular unconformity is. But the uh, key thing is that one, you can see the base of conglomerates. The key thing is you can see those uh, extremely stretched strips. So those are quartzite marbles, uh, sorry, quartzite uh, uh, cobbles that get a flattened, a stretch. So you can see the magnetic doctor deformation and those are the rocks that are depositionally on top of the granulite facing rocks get a folded, okay? So this is sort of the key relationship. So first is that the Limpopo belt, the shear zone, this actually is right above the uh, projection of the Palala shear zone. So if you, rotate those sedimentary rocks back to horizontal, the Limpopo shear zone is not vertical, but a sub-horizontal. So this is the uh, most important point. The second point is that this struck me in the field as a structure geologist. 
you see this uh, foliation, which is goes very straight. And you see here, you have the folds going like this, you see that. So if this is a cross-section view, like what I show on the right-hand side, the structure geology called this a detachment of folds. That is, you have a detachment surface on top, you have a folds, Drawer Mountain style deformation, okay? But why strike the fault has this one? We know that strikes the fault, fundamentally the boundary, shear boundary is a symmetric. So if you shear in this direction, if you give a folds on this side, you should have a folds on the other side, but you see this side is a flat. This side is like this. Okay, so then what is a possibility? Okay, so when you uh, 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 play with the pictures, you can just rotate. So this is exact picture, I rotate 90 degrees. And now this becomes a vertical foliation. You can see that. So this folds looks like that. Um, you know, does this look that? Yes, it is. So what if this is just a detachment and this whole section is folded? Is that a consistent? Yes, it's consistent with what we just talked about, that uh, the, the shear zone covered by sediments, sediments get rotated 90 degrees. If you rotate that part, this part will also be rotated back. Then you generate this uh, a regular uh, detachment fold. So what I envision is something like this. So Limpopo shear zone is a sub-horizontal detachment, get a folded, rotated to this direction, depending on how you fold it. So then you get, uh, for this particular situation, you fold like this, you get a right slip uh, shear. So that's the second piece of evidence. So then um, I look at the literature, this area right here show in the right box. So this part of the Palala shear zone, very well mapped by uh, McCord and uh, his colleague. So what did they find is that, so they have a very detailed transect, they have a few pictures, stuff. This is the one site I have not visited, but I took their words and look at their few pictures. So basically they have a two domains. One domain is a left slip. One domain is a right slip right over here. So when you say, well, how can you have the parallel shear zones? They have a op opposite sense of a shear. So here is the explanation in this uh, folded shear zone model. So not only you have the overall big folding, like a big boat, but also inside a boat, you have a many parasitic smaller scale folds that also fold the shear, early shear zones. So here, just to show an example of if you have the shear zones get a folded, you'll find that the originally same horizontal shear zone, once you fold it into a sink line, you get an opposite sense of shear. Okay. And this is a, a hallmark of a, a folded uh, uh, detachment, uh, uh, detachment feature. Okay, so now <laughs> this basically concludes what, uh, what, what I have to say uh, about the Limpopo, but just a few more things. So question is, where is the missing craton? I don't know, uh, but it's, so the, the model requires a missing craton, that's one thing. Second, the model also requires that the Caval and the Zimbabwe is one united craton, has never been separated, at least since 2.6. And then you have this uh, 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 strip of a granulite belt that's a, a, a lock fundus coming, uh, even though it's an internal <laughs> deformation a thrust sheet, I think it's probably, still native to the uh, uh, cre uh, craton, but that also make the craton a lot bigger before uh, when you restore that uh, thrusting, like a restore Himalayas, we generate a greater India. So I say, if I restore the uh, a Limpopo belt, we'll generate something called a greater combined Caval and uh, Zimbabwe craton. Okay, so look around. <laughs> the closest one, I think uh, maybe, um, this so-called regional uh, granite belt of a uh, who uh, made this uh, 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 labeling. So this could be a, a, a Congo, but it could be any other um, other uh, plutonic uh, uh, arc arc system. Both uh, Alfred and I we noted that the, the 2.0 arc actually is relatively rare, so this could be a future uh, research direction. So just to rehammer that uh, greater India kind of a hypothesis versus a greater Zimbabwe and a Caval, that is that this entire sheet is uh, in place from, oops, is in place from 
the greater part of this, uh, this continent. So if you put this back, they combined all the Zimbabwe and uh, Kaval Kraton would be this big. So when people try to restore this back to Pilbara, we would probably need to think about this. Okay, so that's all I have to say. <laughs> I already heard the people knocking my door, probably trying to send the candidate to my room, but I just pretend I, I'm not here. Okay, so I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, An. Can you hear me well enough? I'm speaking. Yeah, I can well. hear well. Great, great. Yeah. Okay, so thanks for that. Let's go ahead and swiftly move to the discussion and questions. You can ask either by typing it up or finding the raise hand button at the bottom. Yeah, absolutely. I think a typing might be easier or sometimes the, the talking gets very choppy. Okay, yeah. Uh, either way is fine. Maybe everybody oh. agrees with you. <laughs> exactly. Maybe maybe I I can ask my question. Uh, ask myself a question. That is, what? you have the granulite. Yeah, extends so far, and that has always been. Uh, people say, well, how can you have a granulite even for thrust belt going so far? Does it mean that you have a thirty to forty kilometer section? piling up on top of the combined Kaval, uh, Zimbabwe, Kreetown, and then you eroded a 30, 40 kilometer. I said, no, <laughs> because when you have the thrust, it's like Himalayas, when the thrust started coming up the ramp, they started getting erosion. So then the actual ones that actually climbing on the surface of the, uh, in this Gan Gangetic plane is rather thin crust because they were already denudated. Okay, so, but if you go down below Tibetan Plateau, of course, you have the entire knot of 30, maybe 50 to 70 kilometer on top of the subducted Indian cross. But that part was a granulite phase, but the granular phase, when they transported over the ramp towards the, the Indian continent, the foreland, it already eroded quite a bit. Yeah. Okay, Ken, I see you raise your hand. Yes. Um, a question I have, is there any paleomag data that is uh, you have rather conf confidence in from the Zimbabwe craton and the Kotval craton that would indicate their positions uh, prior to this time, or that they were together or not together? That's a great question. Uh, from what I read, um, I know that Dave uh, uh, Evans did some work on mostly on those uh, uh, dolerite or those uh, very uh, relatively short time um, events. And they, I, I, I don't think anyone has ever done systematic testing on the two sides. But from the geology, they, the two sides look very similar. Both a 2.6 billion year, uh, deformed uh, orthonysis uh, mingled with uh, uh, greenstone belts. Yeah, um, you know, no, no one has ever really done that kind of systematic. I think the key is really the very southwestern end of the Limpopo belt. Unfortunately, it's all covered by uh, desert material, so you can't really see the basement. I think that should be linked right there. Maybe some subsurface. Uh, drilling or uh, study, yeah. Yeah, Daryl. Uh, where's the molasse? Ha, very good question. Yes, where is the molasse? Okay, we would expect that when you have a, such a big uh, a thrust belt that must be loading, that must be a, a, a foreign basin. So given the, the rocks surrounding this uh, thrust sheet, they're all, and feel like Grinch's faces. I think any fallen basin would have been eroded away. So that's you know one possible exp uh, explanation. But related to that problem, this is what uh, Alfred Croner and I, we 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 kept talking about. We know that uh, the Dabi Shan in uh, uh, in central China, when that area ultra high pressure rock eroded, 
so much sediments went to this uh, uh, remnant uh, ocean, uh, ocean basin we call the Songpan Gansu, very much like the uh, uh, Bay of Bengal. So there should be a big pile of sediments. So I think somewhere in the world, you know, not, you know, so if the, the, the foreign base is missing, we should see a big pile of sediment 2.0. So I want to ask Andrea <laughs> and uh, Alex, so all those people doing Precambrian sedimentology, where do you see very, very thick turbidite sequence of a 2.0? So I think that is, uh, you know, even without this model, you have to explain the granulite facey rocks expose such a large area. It cannot be tectonic in, in terms of normal fault, tectonic estimation, there's a normal fault estimation, it has to be eroded. Where did all the eroded material go? So there you put uh, your finger on the <laughs> on the most critical question in the sort of earth system kind of a thinking um and, and and that also make the uh 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 model like this exciting because it has quite a bit of a prediction yeah thank you yeah maybe i cannot uh can you hear me uh um yeah i can maybe, hear you yeah a little bit choppy. yeah with a yeah, with a little bit uh, yeah okay so so the um the magandi belt used to be correlated to Hayes belt but now Hayes belt i think considered much younger so it seems like this western margin doesn't continue from zimbabwe to Capwell. Uh, that's one point uh, i don't know might be relevant to you and second point in limpopo belt there are around 2.1 2 billion uh, sediments that are metamorphosed okay. but we sort of correlative to um, succession in magandi belt so i don't know if how how does it fit to your model Yeah, so there is a, this. Uh, you, you also know that this. Uh, this uh, th there is a Limpopo belt has a very thick section of metal sedimentary rocks, and I think they are. Uh, I think that they are. Uh, yeah, two two point one. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it could be slightly older, slightly younger, but but predating the uh, the uh, uh, granulite phase event. I I I interpret that as a part of the. Uh, passive counter margin section. So, so that would be in the Himalaya session that would correlate to the greater Himalaya sequence or the lesser Himalaya, lesser Himalaya sequence. Both have a very, very uh, high component of uh, sedimentary rocks from the passive counter margin. So they were first uh, subducted to, you know, the so-called Barovian uh, 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 metamorphism. So, so first subducted, and then they, they get uh, warmed up <laughs> by relaxing the thermal gradient. And then um, you know maybe other other processes that get them. So Himalaya has a, a few places the granulite face is exposed. So maybe just erosion is not a big enough. If you go down a little bit more, you will see the granulite faces. But for the uh, Limpopo, basically you see everything is a granulite face. The amphibolite on top got eroded away. So I would say that would be the root zone in the Himalaya. That would be root zone of the Greater Himalaya coming from a, a originated uh, source from the continent margin from the you know that a missing continent or part of the continental margin so it would be coming to from the from from west? northeast from a northeast from a northeast okay yes okay yeah, so so that means that it may be the magandi belt which it maybe may wraps around it could be part of this a uh, 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 lo longer longer system, um, you know, in terms of the uh, sedimentary, uh, you know, transport. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be my sort of a uh, interpretation. Okay, thank you. Yep. But you know, I'll be honest, I have not thought about those things very carefully for a long time. <laughs> okay, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess the falsifying prediction of your model is that the um, uh, decoma, the detachments uh, with the opposing senses of shear should be coeval. So yes. you can figure out a way of dating um, 
you know, the synchromatic age of the two, that would be a way of, uh, of testing your model. Um, remind me- Yeah, exactly. I think that this- Yeah, uh, go ahead. Oh, see, 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 this is the problem. So every, so we basically, the best the chronometer are leucogranites because they are, there's so many generations. So this is the problem. Your data sync kinematic, or pre-kinematic, post-kinematic, they all plus minus about 10 million years in this area. I think you're frozen, Paul. Is there any paleomagnetic data on the Great Dyke? It could be compared Great with- Great dike, you know what? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Great, great dike, I love that great dike. I went all the way to Zimbabwe with a collected and my advisor, Greg Davis was so pleased that he said when he was on the grid, he wrote an essay about a great dike. He said this is the first time he actually saw the great dike I collected. Uh, I'm not aware, I'm not aware, but a great dike is a 2.4. So I think that, that would uh, give you some kind of, uh, yeah, directions. But Great Dyke gets a truncated, chop it up um, into, the, into the Limpopo belt when it comes south uh, right. into the northern, yeah, northern margin zone. Yeah. But the yeah, I, I, pole, if it existed, could be compared with uh, a coeval unit in Kopfall or in Tobin. Yeah, right? so you probably know, yeah, you probably know there's another, Dick Armstrong, who did a lot of dating, right. but yeah, not our great David So yes. he did quite a bit of dating across uh, 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 Zimbabwe and uh, uh, Kaval with mm -hmm. many episodes of mafic uh, dolerite intrusive rocks. Um, I think they can do, but my understanding when I talk to Zheng Xiangli, my classmate, old friend, and many others is that when you want to do the paleo latitude uh, determination, you really need to have a, some kind of a little bit of time average and also lots of samples. If you just have a one time, because you have this uh, polar wander, uh, uh, the uh, uh, mag Second magnetic, variation. yeah, va variation. So that can be very uncertain. I th and then when I talked to him about this problem, he said, you know, you really need to have some kind of a, say volcanic pile sequence. So those are dikes, you get a sort of a transient time, either fit or don't fit, they both cannot say anything. So yeah, that's my more, more than one dike. <laughs> more than one dike. And it has to be good at timing, uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you know, also has to need to have the time average as well. Yeah. yeah. See, 2400 is around the age of the Unhuluk volcanics in Kapfal, in the Transvaal. That's, that's true, that's true, yes, yes, yes. So I think the two sides can really be compared. That is a good uh, yeah. I think it's uh, old age. Uh, I think the new age for dike much older, it's 2560 or something, uh, maybe. 2560, okay, so. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so this, you know, everyone do the work on the great dike. Yeah, I always say that I'm glad someone make the great dike great again. <laughs> I, I, I'm also thinking about writing a proposal called Making the Great Dyke Great Again. <laughs> it is a truly amazing feature, natural feature. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, the top of the hour, should we let you go on? I, I can have a, a, a five more minutes. That's okay. Uh, because people already run away, knocking the door okay. very hard. Uh, but. Yeah, so I saw a Paul link there. Long time no see. Any any questions there? Paul is frozen. Yeah, I think Daryl's question about the molasses was good. Uh, there ought to be a pile of zircons somewhere in a in a, a, a thick pile of sediment from all that erosion. Yeah, uh, there's no four yeah. deep in, in the in the Grenville either. Nor the Moritonites. So, you know, there are big origins that don't don't have any preserved 40. But the, well, certainly the, there Grenville, a... the Grenville sediments certainly uh well they're so, somewhere. Yeah. But they're, not, they're not preserved in the, in a foreland basin. Right. But also and you have the same, a foreland. Same is true with the Grenville in South Africa, you know, the Namaqua Natal. Yeah, the foreland basin is so thin. 
Yeah, but also Eastern Tibet, you know, this is where the uh, lower crustal flow comes in. The Eastern Tibet has no foreign basin. So this is what uh, Clark Birchfield and his group worked for 30 years, you know, just to trying to figure out why Eastern Tibetan Plateau, you have a peak as high as 7,000. And the next basin, Chengdu Basin, many of you probably been to Chengdu, which is 500 meters. You have almost a seven, seven kilometer elevation difference. There is no, uh, there is no foreign basin. There is only a few hundred meters of a quaternary sediments in Chengdu Basin. You drill down, all the water wells show Triassic sediments. And we know the uplift has started about 30, 35 million years ago. There's no foreign basin. <laughs> so either it's not coupled with the foreign, or the foreign is so strong, it's coupled that it doesn't make a thing. You know, it's a very, very strong uh, maybe uh diving climate. Board. Maybe climate. Well, not not climate, not a 30 well to see around Tibet and Plateau, everywhere else you get a foreign basin. You know, why does Eastern Tibet is so, so, uh, uh, you know, so special? You get a Himalaya, you get a northern part of Chilean Shan, in the uh, Alton Talk area, you get a Turin Basin. So you get uh, foreign basins everywhere. And that, you know, if you look at a mountain friend, is as impressive as the Himalayas. No foreign basin. Okay, I think maybe it's time for me to move to host the next speaker. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for this great opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Han. Thanks for your contribution to the seminar series. It's really good. All right, everybody, okay. take care. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.